from mud bogging, work in the fields, or just cruising, the Tire Lady has just the right tire for you. And if you want your ride to really stand out, ask about tire and wheel combinations. Get the most out of your vehicle with the perfect set of shoes from the Tire Lady at Rainbow Tire in Masontown. The Tire Lady will take care of you. Rainbow Tire, the Tire Lady takes care of me. At the Landing Dental Spa, our goal is to provide quality dental care at a relaxed spa-like atmosphere. Dental chairs with heat and massage, warm neck wraps, and personal TVs make your appointment as stress-free as possible. Located off the Pierpont exit, now accepting new patients of any age. Call 304-594-2200 today and visit our website at www thelandingdentalspa.com to schedule an appointment. The Landing Dental Spa, a healthy smile with peace of mind. engineer for District 4, uh, which includes, of course, Montegay County. With me today, I brought some of my staff, so if you have a hard question, they'll answer it for you. But uh, we have Jason Nelson. He's the one, when all this construction starts this fall or this summer, he's the one that will be overseeing all that construction. Uh, this is my son, they call him. <laughs> it's Mr. Pumphrey. He works in our design section. Raymond Tackett is my head of right away. I brought him along in case you have any questions with some of the projects, like the mile ground, for example. Uh, we're in the process of purchasing all that right away as we speak. Mr. Harris, um, what do we want to call you? Just a nice guy. Just a nice guy. <laughs> Randy's our bridge engineer, and uh, he takes care of all our bridges in the whole district. And then we got John uh, Vincent, he's my design engineer. And we have AJ back, he's our Preston County boy. But he does all our um, planning, helps us with our planning, things of that nature. Also today presenting, and um, we have Damien, who's gonna talk about some of the city projects. We have Bill Austin with the MPO. And we and I forgot my sheet, but we have some representatives from WVU, is that correct? Right, and you're gonna talk here in a minute about some of the WVU projects. Um, this is a very informal meeting, but as I was thinking a few weeks ago, with all the amount of work coming to the Morgantown area in particular, and Montegay County too, we thought it would be prudent to at least get some information out concerning the summer and what's happening. Um, if I could say it and be very honest, it's unprecedented the amount of work coming. We'll look at this in a few minutes uh, to the Montegay County and specifically Morgantown. It's going to be a time that we're going to have to be patient but I think that the results will outweigh any of the delay. The benefits will make a difference in your lives, and we'll talk about those here in a second. What we've handed you are two things. First is a spreadsheet. Now this spreadsheet, okay, has a number corresponding to each project, okay? And with that number, there's a map. There are some extra maps, I believe, if you'd like to have one. So if you look on this sheet and you look at number eight, for example, if you go on the map at number eight, they correspond, okay? So what the spreadsheet does is tell you about the specific projects. Now this also has a history on it. This has projects already completed. It has projects that's anticipated, like in, 
18, 19, and 20. Some of it looks out a little bit into the future. Today we're going to be talking about the 18, 19 projects, uh, more or less. So on this, if you look at this, this will correspond to the map. So a number on this corresponds to a number on the map. Does that make sense? So it gives you a little more detail. So if you're wondering, um, but there's also a legend on the map that shows you some of the different categories. For example, one thing I'd like to point out is the little triangles or the little diamonds. It's called DMV funds. If you look on your map, everywhere you see a blue diamond, that means 2018. Blue is 18. The diamond was what we call DMV funds. So, for example, we've been collecting the money, right? The tax, the, uh, the extra tax on DMV fees, things like that. We haven't bought the geo bonds yet. We're in the process of buying those as we speak. The money that's been generated since July of 2017 has been coming in, and the DOH and their management has put that money back out, okay? So everywhere you see a diamond, those are monies that's being done, or has been done with the DMV fees. So a lot of times people ask us, well, how has it helped us in maintenance? Well, the geo bond money, for example, the big gas tax increase, most of that money is going toward the larger projects of which Montague County has been uh, very blessed in that. But a lot of the money's coming in has been poured back into our communities, and I think that's really been a big um, boost for us, getting us extra payment. So with that said, what we'd like to do is show you some slides of some of the major projects. We're only showing you the major projects on the slide. Some of these projects um, are up for debate yet, but these are things that we think are coming. I'd also like to talk about River Road just a little bit. I don't want to go into a lot of detail, but it's in the early stages as we make some decisions to move forward on the River Road. And I might even talk some about uh, pedestrians a little bit and our stakeholders committee. Uh, once I'm completed with my presentation, if it's okay, we'll turn it over to WVU. Where are they at? Over here. You guys. And then Morgantown, and then Phil. Yeah. If you're going to have that, we'll kind of go in that order. We don't have a set agenda. Would that be okay with everyone? Okay. So with that being said, if Jason will go, we'll go over some of the projects. Um, I'm sorry. No, let's go through your okay. the way you guys set up. Also, and it's kind of hard to see, um, the blues has a big bright light here. It's also on the back wall if that helps you. It helps me a little bit. But in our projects, as we look at 2018-19, we got five major bridge projects with reconstruction, six major resurfacing projects. And if you see the word PO or the abbreviation PO, that means purchase order. These are um, contracts where we do the preliminary work and then the um, contractors come out and does some resurfacing. So we have, in this type of active projects, we got 14 current projects at 12 point $5 million. Next, please. Upcoming uh, program overview, we got 20 bridges, widening reconstruction, uh, 14 resurfacing projects, 14 purchase orders, slide repairs, again those are contracts we put out on the state level, and seven surface treatment. Now surface treatment is projects we do at a lower level. These are like the gravel roads, some people call them tar and chip, you ever heard that expression, tar and chip? Matter of fact, we are doing them as we speak. This is great weather to do darn chip. We do that with our own forces. Now, some of these projects aren't shown in the presentation, but a lot of them are shown on the map. Is that correct? So if you're wondering, well, is my route going to get paid this year, next year, is my route getting surface treated, things of that nature. So we got coming 45 projects around $65 million of work. Next, please. Now, this is kind of hard to see, but this is a pretty remarkable um, graph that we put together. The yellow, and you can't read none of this, but you can see the yellow. We've been working internally about how can we handle all this work. So Mr. Nelson here has put together a, a spreadsheet where we've listed on the left side every project coming, 18, 19, and 20, potentially. Some of these aren't programmed yet, but they're on the list to be programmed or to be funded. Some of these are geo bond projects, as you're aware of Montegillian County. For example, the Greenback Road, geo bond. Van Voorhis, geo bond. Um, West Run, geo bond. Um, we've got several major projects like that, are all geo bond projects. They're listed as potentials as we think they'll come. But if you look at 
the first vertical line to the third or fourth vertical line, that's only 18 going into 19. Look how many projects we have there. It's a massive amount of work potential, and actually internally we're having great discussions about um, trying to open up a new field office in, just in Morgantown to handle the additional work because we don't have the staffing nor the um, facility. So we're working on that as we speak, trying to open up a new facility here that could have as many from 15 to 30 employees in it just to do inspection on the work coming to Montegelli County. Next, please. <laughs> yeah, these are the maps that have been handed to you. The big map of Montegelli County is, shows all the projects. In the lower left on the map, the, the PowerPoint presentation, is kind of an outline of the projects we're going to be talking about today. And again, I'm not showing you every little surface treatment, every paving project. They're on your spreadsheet, but it's there for you along those lines. So these are what we consider high projects. There are projects that are going to have a lot of potential for traffic control. Uh, a lot of things that's going to make the residents' life a nightmare in the next several years here in the Morgantown area. I can speak to this. As many of you know, I live here in Morgantown. I live off Stewartstown Road near the University Farm. Many of the roads that we're talking about, I'm right in the middle of it. So we're moving to Montana. <laughs> that was my solution to the whole situation. But no, um, it's one of these things, like I said, and that's what we're trying to do today, is prepare us for this with some patience and trying to get the news out that this is what's going to happen. We're not very good at this in the past. We just do a press release. Today we're trying to get the word out of the potential work. So next please. So the first one I'd like to talk about is University Avenue. Um, this is what's called an ultra-thin high-performance overlay. Now, a lot of these things, is this the one with the gravel? No, no this, this is just the overlay. had the alternate with the overlay. Yeah. So what we do on these projects, and you'll say, well, why are you paving such a small amount that's going to be an altered thin? We have a very sophisticated computer program and a system of analysis that some of our major roads, if we hit them with an overlay very quickly before they get too bad, they add a lot of life to the project. And that's what these ultra high performance overlays do. Am I right, John? They're to add life to that section of road. So today we may invest 500,000, but it saves us millions over the next seven or eight years. Short duration of work, um, in terms of um, how long it takes, it's not going to take probably like a two week project, probably two or three weeks. Actually, it's going on right now. That's going on right now, okay. It's between you and the Avenue and Collins area. Okay, so at that short section out there, um, going out that way. So that project should be done here fairly soon. Next, please. <coughs> Blue Horizon. Up at the border, and I just can't read it very well, major interstate reconstruction. Uh, this is one of the big three they call it in the whole state. Major reconstruction. These are warranty jobs. I think it's a nine year warranty. This is a little unique for us. And what we do, we let this project, I think it's bare contracting, they got it. Was it 16 some million? 16 and a half million. Yeah, 16.5 million. They are completely reconstructing that interstate. We're talking all the way down through the concrete and back up. That's why it has a nine-year warranty. It's called a design build because we don't tell them how to fix it because they're the ones responsible for the warranty. Project's been left. We've been having some discussions. They're going to reestablish super elevations. It's going to be modern pavement. They're going to go down to the concrete. I think they're going to rubbleize it, which means they're going to break all that concrete pavement up, which eliminates the reflective cracking that comes through the asphalt. Rebuild the section, and it'll be a nine-year warranty project. Uh, that project, you've seen the cones already out. We anticipate it starting here fairly soon. Uh, there was a lot of traffic analysis done on that project. Do you, do you know how long it is? How long that project is? It's five miles right from the Pennsylvania line toward Mount Morris, back on I-79. So we're going to be looking at that real close to make sure traffic control is working. Luckily, the traffic does, you know, filter down some as you get up to the Pennsylvania line. So we don't think it's going to be a major problem, but we're looking at that. So major problem, almost 17 million. Montegelli County, I-79, five miles, complete reconstruction from the base layer up, nine-year warranty project, getting ready to start here any day. Next, please. Whitenade Creek Bridge, anybody 
What is it, on Route 73? Yeah, um, we're looking at that. Is this one of your projects, Randy? We didn't design it, but it's an overlay. Yeah, it's the overlay of that bridge. Um, is it the one underneath the interstate or on the interstate? It's on the interstate. So it's an interstate bridge. We go in there, we do resurfacing where they actually take it down. Probably a latex overlay yes. uh, as it comes back. Uh, sometimes they're the ones into the details, and that's why we bring the thing. Um, Latex overlays are a very good way to fix the bridge decks. They're very expensive. They go down to the top layer of rebar. They remove it. Again, they'll do it one lane at a time. Is typically the way they do it. A lot of traffic delays with this on the interstate. It was just one of those things. Now, I'll give you a little heads up. We get, it's funny, every time we do a bridge project like this, we'll get these phone calls that, oh my goodness, there's nobody working, but you got traffic control on. You have to remember, these are concrete products. A lot of times when we pour deck section, you have to let it cure like seven, 10, 12 days. There's all this criteria. So it may not be a worker standing there, in this case a contractor, but that material has to cure before we can switch traffic and do the other side. So it's amazing how many phone calls I get. Well, I just drove through a work zone, it was three miles long. <laughs> There's not a soul standing there. And we just poured the deck, okay? <coughs> Concrete's a unique product. It's not like asphalt. You can put it in place, roll it, put traffic on it within an hour. Concrete's a whole different animal. So that's a big project, redoing that whole deck on the White Day um, Bridge. Next, please. Goshen Road intersection. Anybody get off at Goshen Road? Hmm. Pilot station? Yep. Nobody? Yes. Oh, we have to talk about it. Barbara, mm -hmm. does she work there? It's terrible. This is a... It is, <laughs> Well, it's not going to be for long. We've got a project there that consists of widening some turning lanes going into the pilot. I believe, and Josh can help me with this, the pilot station actually is participating on this. It's helping us with the funding on it. If you're aware of that project, um, we can't keep the asphalt in that location because every time we do, those heavy trucks, just by its nature, the way they stop and go, it just deteriorates it. Uh, we've tried different things. This is a major reconstruction of all that asphalt. Some widening, making it much safer. Is it going to be a pain? Absolutely. Oh my God. Okay, there's no way around this because there will be lane closures um, on the side roads. We've told them in our traffic control they can't back the concrete up, or I'm sorry, the traffic up onto the interstate, onto the off ramps <laughs> or the on ramps because you can imagine all that heavy truck traffic trying to get off to go to the pilot station. Um, traffic control is probably the hardest part of this project, trying to keep vehicles moving not only to the business at the pilot station, but also to residents, of which Mr. Puffrey lives right on the other side. So we don't care about him, but the other ones we do care about. <laughs> but no, that area. So one thing that's really smart is you look at this and you start learning the patterns. For example, it might be quicker to go down to Pickett's Fort and come back if you live on that side, right? It may be saying, well, I'm not going to the interstate home if I live on that side of 73. I may have to go downtown Morgantown, like Mon Boulevard, Don Knox, come in the back way. As local residents, you just have to learn how to adjust to what's there. But this is a pretty major project. It's going to be a good project. I think helping that intersection and the ingress and uh, exits there. But anyways, that's a big project. Next, please. When is that going to start? Do you know yet? Josh, you know that? It should be actually um, within the next few weeks. Hmm. Okay. Um, we have a we have a contractor. He's on a few other a few other projects, and they should be moving into that fairly soon. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Okay, I'm sorry to interrupt, but a lot of people are complaining about the, the stretch of 73 from Cricket Sport up to Goshen Road because trucks use that to bypass the weight. They do. Station already. Yeah. So if 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 um, this section is going to be blocked up and that's going to be the shortcut, it's going to get even worse. If the, the pavement is really cracking off on the side, the middle of the pavement is really bad shape. I think we have a schedule for next year, going. We are planning our 2019 paving at this point, breaking up the money for the counties, associating jobs. We actually came that way because we ran into some traffic. We are initially looking at that being 2019 paving, that section. Our standard paving for a PSE job is about $12 a square yard. 
when we drove up there, a standard paving is not going to work on that job. Hmm. We're looking at like a cold in place recycling and an overlay. I just ran numbers from the Marion County line up that job. I'm looking at 1.1 million. And that's what we're looking for as part of our funding for next year. Thank you very much. Yeah, we're aware of that. And of course, you wouldn't want to do it. We do all this traffic bypassing. We try to phase things. Uh, we get a lot of phone calls on that section, uh, but it's one of many sections we have. But you, uh, thank you, Josh, for that. This is a high friction overlay on I-68. Um, what we do, we have a highway safety location, our unit within the division of highways, and they look they use highway safety money usually for this, where aggregate it weathers it polishes over time so if you can imagine a piece of aggregate in the asphalt when it's new it's real sharp but when it gets a lot of traffic it polishes and gets slick right so we call this a high friction course and they're going to go in there and put on a high friction course that says uh, i think it says the approach is a bridge that carries westbound 68 how long is this one jason it goes from, it's basically just the, um, I know it's hard to see on the picture, but yeah. it's the, uh, if you're heading west on 68 to, and trying to go south on 79, it, 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 it's, a, it's the limits of the approaches of that flyover bridge that, okay. that, and the, the, the ramps, basically, because okay. that's where we have a lot of sliding type. So it's not going to be a very long duration project. It's actually only going to last about two nights. Two nights. So you're going to see back, and it looks like they have traffic restrictions there, uh, 7 p.m. to 6 a.m. They'll do that work at night. But what that does, especially with super elevation, you know, the road tilts as you're going around these curves, um, it really helps. It's much safer. So this is not a major project in the terms of what you might see, but it has a major impact on our uh, safety. That intersection, for example, over the years, um, I'm a big fan of the high mass lights they put in. We're going, is it on our slides? The other project? No, well, no, because it's already glaring. Yeah. There. But we have a, um, if you've noticed out there, anybody noticed the big track machines doing drilling? Mm -hmm. We're putting more of those big high mass signs all through, or not signs, but the lights. Um, if you remember about, I don't know what it was, three or four years ago, they did all the high mass. Those are gigantic lights with the LED. I mean, they're powerful. That made that intersection so much safer, you know. And now they're expand, expanding that all the way through exit one. And I can't remember where it ends. Almost, uh, it's uh, exit one with the high mast and then some sporadic lighting to exit seven. And then there's some signing renovation all the way through the right one line. Yes, ma'am. Could you tell us the project number on this? It's a little confusing since we've never looked at this map before to compare it to the thing. I cannot see that map at all. But if you could tell yeah. us the project number. Yeah. There's a, it's about. number 39. 39. Thank if you, you look so at the much. end of the title, we put the number, and I should have pointed that out. That's my fault. We can't see that. Please. Yeah, I'm having trouble seeing it too, you can tell. Um, number 39 is this one. So if you look on your map, number 39, or on your spreadsheet, matter of fact, your spreadsheet, the lower right hand corner, everything that's in green is on the presentation, right? Okay, so that's 39. So that's a high friction, that's highway safety. It makes our community safer because that intersection is huge, you know, in terms of the amount of traffic. Next, please. Patterson Drive, uh, this one's going to have different approaches to it. There is a project program there that we're not sure about um, in terms of some turning lanes, but what we have decided to do um, was our pedestrian board, and, we, and we'll talk about that in a minute, we formed what's called a subject matter group. And this is a, a committee of experts in the field. And uh, that's our right. He's going to show you pictures of his beautiful children here. In a minute. But let's talk about that while he's fixing that. So I'll just talk about the pedestrian board while Jason's uh, working on that. The pedestrian board, you know, we've had some major issues with pedestrian issues in the Morgantown area. And it's really legitimate. We're trying to work with this. And we formed two committees. Julie's with us today from WVU. We have a committee, it's a steering committee, and then we put together what's called a subject matter expert. People like Dr. Ron and you know, people from the university, and Damien's on it from the city of Morgantown. 
Well, the Patterson Drive section is one of our top 10 priorities that we're going to use it as a demonstration project. We're going to look at ways to improve pedestrian safety on the Patterson Drive. Okay, so that might mean different types of lights, signals, uh, adjusting signals, different types of crosswalks. We're not sure yet. But the subject matter group is going to work together on this to try to come up with a project, hopefully for next spring, that will take Patterson Drive and make it much more pedestrian friendly. Okay, uh, we tried to push it maybe to this year, but to do it well, I, we thought we were going to have to have enough time to really study it. So Patterson Drive is still in our thoughts. <laughs> You know, as we look at this, and it will be a project um, for the pedestrians. Next. Now that one also is number sixty-three, including the lighting as well, which is has been led. And right. Will be upgraded. Okay, that's not a separate one. No, that's this one right here. Okay. You can't see light. I'm I wish sorry. I could change the background, but there's a, an old yeah. viewer on this computer, and it won't let me yeah. do it. Well, Jason brings up another great point. One of the keys to pedestrian issues in general is always illumination, right? The more illumination we have, the more lighting systems we have, the better it is uh, for that system. So Patterson Drive has a contract uh, to install a lot of lighting through that section. Uh, and hopefully that's going to help, again, anytime we can illuminate an area, especially from pedestrian perspectives, it's helpful. So we're looking at Patterson Drive. It's from University Avenue to the Coliseum, Mon Boulevard. It's not a very long section, but I think the ADT on that section is around 34,000 cars a day or something like that. Uses that. Uh, we did an average speed study on it for the police officer when you kick out of this. The posted speed is 35, and the average city fifth percentile was like 42 or 45 miles an hour. And we got two people in our speed study going over 70 miles an hour in Patterson Drive. <laughs> so if you want to make some extra money, we just give you <laughs> But these are all issues. We've been working really strongly with our law enforcement and others on these pedestrian issues, and we're pretty excited about what we're going to come up with. Um, Mon Boulevard, what's the number, Jason? Can you tell? I don't know what that big bright light is right in the middle. Uh, number 50? 50. That project was just led. I think Mountaineer Contracting got it. It's a project from um, the intersection of Patterson Drive and Mon Boulevard right there at the Coliseum. It goes all the way down the hill to the Star City Bridge. That section is going to be widened to five lanes. Also, there will be sidewalks installed along that section. And this will also eliminate any on-street parking like during basketball games and things like that. That is a, quite a serious safety issue when we look at pedestrians. Uh, we look at the traffic control pattern, so that's going to eliminate <coughs> on-street parking all the way through there because now there's going to be sidewalks and things of that nature. This should help with capacity on this section of highway. Is I think it has a continuous left turn lane to full distance. You know, like right now, if you're coming up the hill, for example, you won't go into the old Shoney's. You ever got stopped in traffic there? People trying to make a left turn? Mm -hmm. That's all going to be eliminated because it'll be a left turn lane, two lanes, sidewalks, a big wide shoulder. It's really going to make our community much safer. Next, please. Mile ground project. How I many have you heard about the mile ground project? This is actually a geobond project. It goes from the intersection of Hartman Run Road um, there at the Honda dealership to the roundabout. You know, what's interesting, we get a lot of calls, like we did Easton Hill, for example, the bottom, the intersection. <coughs> I've got so many calls about what idiots we are, that we just built that and it can't go anywhere. There's all these extra lanes, and it's like, they're all pieces of a puzzle, the roundabout that was built, for example, at the end of the mile ground, um, which I'm a fan of, and I think it works most of the time really well. But if you ever notice, there's two lanes in the roundabout that goes to one lane, but it's designed for a two-lane section. On the other end, the Easton Hill project, and we're not going that far to the intersection, there's another project between the intersection of Easton Hill to the mile ground. Is that right? Yes, sir. And that's held up in some right-of-way issues yet, I believe. We're currently in requiring right-of-way. Yeah, that with project. the FFA and some... Uh, we expect... Oh, well, we're, we're uh, currently cooperating with the city on acquiring the uh, properties from the municipal airport. Yeah. And we're also uh, buying the properties from Parkland Run Road down to the Good. Uh, roundabout. But this project in particular is from, like I said, the Honda dealership to the roundabout that's existing. 
uh, five lane section. You know, we have a continuous turn lane. It's got new sidewalks. It's got pedestrian issues to cross the road. The roundabout's going to work better. And then there's still going to be, and I want to emphasize, there's still another project coming between the Eastern Hill intersection and the, um, this project. This is being funded by your geo bonds. It's one of the first rounds. They call it Wave 1 of the geo bond. I think it's around $15 million in project. A lot of utility work. A lot of land to buy. Mr. Tackett's been working on that with a consultant. Uh, I think we're on the verge of getting it all obtained or pretty close. Well, we made all the offers. Uh, we expect to certify the project. What that means is uh, that enables the Division of Highways to advertise the bids for construction. We expect that to happen late this summer or early fall. Yeah. And we're, the last number I saw, they're thinking August of this year led to contract. Uh, major project, major delays, you know, probably in phases. My guess is you're going to see a lot of demolition, moving stuff out of the way first. Then I'll have to move those utilities out of the way, however they deem to do that, and then the widening. It's been a tough thing for us because we know the mile ground is also in horrible shape. <clears throat> right? The pavement's in bad shape on the mile ground. But we also know this project's coming behind us, so the poor, you know, half a million dollars to fix that pavement, knowing that this project's coming right behind it, you know, we have to pick our battles. So we've been trying to do good maintenance on the mile ground when we can. You know, we get a lot of complaints on the mile ground and 705, but we actually work a crew at night whose only purpose is to work on those roads because the traffic is so hot to try to do maintenance on those. So that project will probably start this fall. It may be held over until spring. We'll just have to wait and see, but it's ready. Um, it's almost ready to start. Next, please. The number 64, is this 705? Yeah. This is 705. How many people in this room think 705 needs repairs? <laughs> well, for years, we've tried to make Elda doesn't. Elda knows. Yeah. He just walks. You know, 705 was built, if you remember, some of you can so you probably have better institutional knowledge of this than I, but it was essentially that concrete pavement. A lot of it was put in for the new football stadium. Right. And the football stadium was built in the early 80s, is that right? Like 81-ish? That's how long that pavement's been there, since the early 80s. And um, it's concrete pavement, as you're very aware of, and those joints have failed everywhere. And what the division has done over the years, we've tried to maintain those joints. And now they're failed longitudinally, traversally. There's massive failures in that system. Hmm. And it's costing me a fortune of time. We just can't keep it up, all right, along those lines. So what we decided was, as a team, we looked at that and we said, we've got to fix 705 properly, okay? We have a consultant that's facing up the plans as we speak, Thrasher Engineering. Uh, they're facing up the design. We're going to take all that bad pavement, cut all those joints out, replace them correctly. Um, when the whole project's done, we're going to do what's called a micro grind. I think that's the official term. Essentially, it's a machine with grinders on it. We'll smooth the whole area with all the repairs. And what we're hoping is a 705 will be up to the condition it was almost as good, <coughs> very close to it. Three million dollars to fix all that concrete. Three million. That's what we're looking at to fix all that concrete. What does this mean though? You may have the mile ground, for example, working. And you may have 705 working. Because we got to get this out of the way before some of the other big projects come in. So what we've told our designers uh, that's putting on the traffic control, what we're hoping is uh, on 705, they will be open to two lanes, each direction at all times. Um, we're going to try to be doing light work. Is that correct, Josh? A lot of it will be done at night. Is that correct? Um, we're also <coughs> communication. We our contract will be such that we understand there's football games, special events, things like that, where we try to tidy it up. You know, right now the section is five lanes with a center turn lane. My goal is that we still have two lanes open each direction, but you may eliminate one lane while they're working on it. Again, it's concrete. You can't just fill the hole and go back and an hour later put traffic on it. You have to let it cure properly, things like that. But you know, I drive it every day. I have a a GMC Sierra pickup, it almost throws me through the windshield at times, hitting some of those holes. Have you experienced that, how bad it is? Mm -hmm. So is it worth the patience to get it fixed right, or is it continue the way we are, because we can't fix it? 
again, we just ask for your patience, major project, but I think as far as the community, we all want 705 fixed. We've heard this for a long time. It's a big project. It's going to be a complex project on traffic control. Um, we're also fixing a few sidewalks through that area, some locations, some ADA requirements. But the main emphasis by far will be um, working uh, on the concrete pavement, cutting all those bad joints, lawn, fixing bad places, pop outs. Like I said, my goal is when we're done, it will look like almost new pavement. And then hopefully we're going to instill a better plan on 705 for the maintenance of it in the future that we keep. But DOH doesn't even have the facilities or the equipment to fix 705 properly. The equipment required to fix those joints, we don't even own it. Big cutting saws and equipment like that. It's very specialized equipment. Big project, big delay. Aren't many alternatives around this. We'll be adjusting, hopefully appropriately, as the traffic control dictates. Almost 30-some thousand cars a day use this. So it's going to be quite a delay. Um, my challenge to the community is think about where you work and how can you work around it that's backing up at. Alternating shifts, changing your shift times. You know, I'm not an expert, nor do I have authority over that, but for example, if Milan Pharmaceutical, usually it's the PM peaks are the worst than the AM peaks. That's Mr. Austin, that usually correct there? And that's because everybody lets out, right? What time do you get off work? Five o'clock, four o'clock. So all the traffic hits that at the same time. So I would challenge our community, like if you're a WU hospital or Milan Pharmaceutical, Nile, places that are big generators, right? Look at that and say, well, what could we do? You know, what if we let our employees come in an hour early and we leave at three? What if we come in at 9 and leave at 6? So if you stagger that some, it takes some of that capacity out and spreads it out. Just an idea, but it's, it's going to be a tough project because there is not a good alternative route around 705. There are some ways around it, but they're not good alternative routes. So um, bear with us on that one. Can you see the number, Barbara? 64. Thank you. <laughs> Next, please. Rodney figured it out. Yeah, he's pretty handy. <laughs> I guess he wants to do it. <clears throat> yeah, 100 and ditch run. There's an intersection project there. Number 58. Yeah, number 58. Intersection and terminus radius. It's a pretty straightforward project. Uh, I don't think it'll have a gigantic impact on the downtown Morgantown by no means. But if you're going down to what is it, Maysville, down yeah. in that area. Yeah, that's probably the, one of the busier intersections in that area anyway. Yeah. I think a lot of people use this area for bypasses too. You know, you'll hear me use an expression, people's mm -hmm. like water. Mm -hmm. They'll take the path of least resistance to get where they want to go. You know, I was in Osage the other day and it just amazed me. You know, we've got that big slide out there. We've got all those signs that road closed. I watched a guy pull that sign out and go around it and drove around that slide to save him, what, 30 seconds? And we're constantly having to put those signs back because people are moving them because there's room for a car, but the whole thing slipped over the hill. It could go any day. And they move our sign to keep going around. Same thing, path of least resistance. <coughs> Next. Yeah, just go on now. West Virginia 7, this is the Hardys. Uh, that's number 61. 61. This was a project that was anticipated to be let. We had some community discussions. Concern is this is where we were going to eliminate the alleyway or the small road between um, Route 7 that went to the back road. And we had a lot of input from the community. Essentially, they don't like that. Um, it was a tough thing because what happened here, if you looked at this project, by eliminating that intersection, I believe, and I know Amy's here from HCR, they did a lot of the study on it, not putting her on the spot, but. What happened there was by eliminating that intersection, my understanding was Route 7's level of service went from like a D or F to a C. It really made a significant impact. And this is one of the things we struggle with. You know, do you want the traffic moving better on Route 7, which is a major arterial in the town, versus I think 7 has an ADT over 20,000, it's like 23,000, something like that, versus the inconvenience. But we've listened and we took the comments, we've sent that to our Charleston folks, that's over this. I'm sure they're working with the consultant on this project. And we're going to look at the alternatives of how we need to proceed. 
Um, so if people say, what are you going to do? We don't know. But I do know that with the Greenback Road project that's going on the 857 section, that's going all the way to Mon Boulevard, the Geobond project, this intersection has to be addressed. Okay? One of our goals, and what I told them in our scope notes the other day on the 70, I'm sorry, on the Greenback Road, we met with Mr. Austin and our designers, consultants, not our consultants, but our directors of the consultants. What we're hoping on Greenback, if that project actually makes it and gets to the whole process of being built, is we think that if we design this road at a higher capacity for heavy trucks, we're hoping that will help the trucking issue downtown, right? A lot of people don't want the trucks going downtown, okay, but they're allowed to use that route, but they're coming from Route 7, right? A lot of the, and my goal is anyways, and this is what we told them, that this update of the Greenback Road all the way to Don Knotts Boulevard and then down to Mon Boulevard up through there, that we upgrade this road and make it so appeasable to them that they'll say, I want to use that road. Okay, and that would include this intersection. Okay, so we need to consider that. So um, right now this project's on hold. But I wanted to bring it up to you real quick. Okay, so uh, for you in Star City area, uh, and I apologize, I'm number fifty-three. Number, number fifty-three. Is that intersection where Bortles Avenue is? It's right there at Sheets. That's the intersection where the Sheets comes in to um, Mon Boulevard. They're looking, I think, on uh, was the turning lanes working on that intersection again to help that. Is yeah. that going to be part of the project from Addison to that? Is that separate from that? That's correct. Okay. Yes, it's separate. Yeah, yeah okay. it's separate. This is just the intersection, right, Jason? That's what I know. We don't. I didn't have any plans to reference on that one, so I'm not entirely sure what. The, the plans haven't been created. We're waiting to see what happens with Mon Boulevard. There, there is the Star City tip that widened the, set, the sidewalk through there. Once Mon Boulevard's going to go through there, we're going to have it researched, reanalyzed after the Star City went in, the Mon Boulevard went in, and we're going to try to fit a turn lane, take it out to the right. So we're trying to the capacity issue to help with the capacity to make that intersection work at a higher, what we call, level of service. Next, please. Airport Road Bridge. All right, so this is the broad, I can't see the number, uh, or something. 35? Yeah, 35. Yeah, 35. Okay. <laughs> if you get off exit 7, Pier Pond, Dr. Hawking gets off her lot probably, it's not near his home. And you make a left, it's a bridge over the interstate. That project is a design build, which means the designers, I think they're trying to make the buckets different. I think they're looking at integral designs, uh, the deck. Um, that project's had a lot of problems I know over the years. Randy would know more than I, but it was expansion dams and things like that. Um, so that project, that is Garvey bond money. Remember we talked about Garvey bonds. That's where they borrowed federal money against their future federal monies to buy a bond. I think it was $500 million. This is a Garvey bond project that's touching our local community. Thank you, please. West Run Road, that's an internal project. Um, Josh, you're here. You want to talk about this project? Um, the, the section we are working on is from Van Boris to Riddle. Last year we paved it just to get smooth, to get us a couple years in. What we're looking at on that project is widening it, widening it to two ten-foot lanes with two three-foot shoulders, and to do a full depth reclamation of the materials to make that road stronger, wider the traffic. That that is from Van Voors to the Riddle intersection. Right. Um, you know, I drove Van Voors the other night. I just wanted to check it out. Um, the Van Voors project we just got to complete. I know we call a lot of slack on that, and we apologize for that, but. Something to be on our control, but it looks nice. Most of Van Morris is in pretty good shape now, all the way to the rail trail. And then um, this is tied in, and we have the goal. Does this go all the way over to Stewartstown? Right? But there is a project plan between there. There'll be a project in the future yeah. after the other part of West Run on the other side is part of the GO bond packages. Once they tie that down, and once we tie our section down, ultimately the middle section from Riddle to Swordstown will look at being what? Uh, West Run it became a major bypass. I'm sure during the um, if all this work on 705, 
you'll see people using this as a bypass. Um, and then like one thing Josh said, and I think it's important to understand, on the other side of West Run, when you come to that line on Stewartstown, you make the right back to 19, that section is a geobond project because um, we're constantly getting tractor trailers hung up on the 19 mm -hmm. section. Mm -hmm. And I tell you, GPS right now is not our friend. These truckers will just read whatever it says and, and they'll go. Bill? Yeah, um, just really a little bit to River Road. When restaurant had its improvements over here before zoning was in place, we obviously had slides or, or can potentials there now. He, and the section he's talking about, there's home, uh, a, a series of homes that build up, build up on a hillside and stormwater <coughs> becomes an issue. So where, what happens is the water collects at the bottom in that swale there where the driveway goes to those houses up, up on the hill. The end of your forward thinking, that, that driveway ought to be, or the road at that point needs to be raised about two or three feet to get the water to run over to West Run Creek. After we had that big flood here 20 years ago, and the district put the dam, the pond in there, there's been virtually no flooding down through that area except for the runoff of the building from either that section or the other section of West Run. So it, I don't want to make it any more complicated it is, but River Road is a precursor of some of these things that we probably ought to look at and it has a, a just as much to do with where we build a building as it does with the highway department. Well, on that note, we are not raising the road elevation. We are doing major drainage. We are putting large scale pipes and drainage okay. to get it out. You're talking about the West Run section? The West Run yeah. section between Van Boers and Riddle. Yeah, and, and I don't know how many other road projects around here, but I mean, it, it, if it costs more money to, to do it that way for drainage issues, it's well worth it. No, we don't disagree with that, but it's always a bottom line, and we try to look at that. And you know, a lot of these roads are evolved. You know, West Run was probably a farm road at one time to 15 yeah. residents. Yeah. Yeah. My guess is, if you talk to Mark Nessel Road and them, he'll tell you it was farms. You know, this was probably a very additive road in 1945. But now you got the hospitals. You know, the back door into Mon General. You got all that. But it just it's a good problem to have, but it's a complex problem. But anyways, our Tommy, goal is to update West Run. So. Tommy, I got a question specific to this. You guys have widened West Run from Stewartstown to Riddle, and then from uh, you're going to do Van Voors to Riddle. The the neighborhood association, North Hills Neighborhood Association, is responsible, in my understanding, of the road from the base hmm. of Riddle really? to uh, the stadium. Right. And that's a major cutover, and I think that should be, uh, I'm going to suggest at this point that the state looks at, at taking over that road from that neighborhood association because it's been absolutely torn up by work that the state has done at this point because you guys closed down Van Voors yeah. and did that work and pushed everyone up across it, and that's literally neighborhood paid for, mm -hmm. and that's something that we should probably well, We can look at that, but right now our policy is we don't take any more roads into the system. There's a more torn but yeah. you buy the previous government. For years, well, I mean, we I took, I'm, I'm just I'm, saying, I'm, I don't know, I don't care about the, what it's it's, state I mean, we need to look in the future. I mean, that, I, if I was a neighborhood association, I'm actually have buildings up there. They just put a block there and really cause a problem. Right, but I'm just saying right now, legally, we don't, we took in thousands of roads under the HART program, and it's really called us a heartache you would not believe right now. So anyways, let's but that's, I mean, it's, yeah, I was going to say, we can talk about that later. Yeah, but that's right now, mean, legally, we can't take roads into our system. Okay. That's just what our moratorium is. But it doesn't mean we can't have that discussion or homeowners or, we can have that discussion. Yes? Does this have a number, project number? It does, we just can't see it. Actually, it, it, it does have a number, but it got replaced, and I don't think it got fixed. It's not last on the post chart. No, chart. Yeah, it's 45. That's what's on the screen here. Yeah, it's got the wrong actual title down on the bottom yes, of the block exactly. there. But okay, well, let's move on, please. No. This is the Collins Ferry Interchange. I know this is that. I believe it's Collins Ferry. That's number 20. Yeah, number 20. Uh, this is that intersection there with University and Collins Ferry. I know there's been some controversy. They're looking at putting a roundabout in there. Um, our engineers have been having some consistent meetings on that. Central office is handling this project. And um, I think it's still continuing for a project next year. 
I don't think they've 100% decided yet exactly what's going in there, but that's a pretty messed up intersection the way it aligns, and something needs to be done there. Again, you got to work on these intersections to help with capacity. If the intersection is the weak link, then everything else breaks down. So that project. Next, please. 51. 51. 51. 51. 54. That's Beechhurst and uh, Campus. Yeah, Beechhurst and Campus Drive. Um, this is a project we've been working on with Josh, I believe, coming out here. But I will tell you, we've had extensive studies, and I don't want to steal WU Thunder, but we're looking at the uh, Stansbury Hall replacement in this area. Uh, our consultants are going to work with their consultants to make that Beechhurst um, a much higher capacity. Um, but Beechhurst is a hard location. It's already at level of service F. It has no reserve. So we've been having great discussion with WU, and we're going to work together on that whole section. The Beechhurst Improvement Project is a geobond project. At least it's on the list. Um, it's on wave three or four, so if the monies are still there and all of it trickles down, um, we hope to do that or with additional funding. So we're working with WVU on that and trying to come up with a good solution for that section of Beechhurst. Thank you, please. Minor things, and these are some of the things you don't see on this map. It's on the map, but it's not on the handouts or on the PowerPoint. Things we do every day, the resurfacing jobs 21, surface treatment 7 projects from 18 to 19, small bridge or drainage, there are 6 projects planned, roadway construction improvements, <coughs> slide corrections 5, uh, roadway lighting 2, sidewalk construction upgrade 2. So to give you a little summary on this, and then I want to go over and talk about River Road a section, and then I'm about done my uh, second. So to give you an example of what it's going to look like, you're going to get off at exit 7 on I-68. And if you're heading to the mile ground, you're going to hit a bridge construction project right there within a quarter of a mile. That's a bridge over the interstate there. If you go a little further, you go up to the mile ground. The mile ground is going to have about a two-year project where we're going to be widening the mile ground to the five lanes. Keep going around the mile ground, go through the roundabout, go back to 705. 705, we're going to be um, replacing and repairing much of that concrete pavement, trying to bring that up to a certain level. Huge difference. But then you get to Mont Boulevard at the Coliseum down to the Star City Bridge. You go down that way, that project's also widening the five lanes. The good news is, is, is really building the five lane section through Morgantown that will help us move traffic out. The bad news is, it's going to be a lot of orange drums and a lot of locations. A lot of the work's being planned to be done at night. A lot of this work's going to be behind right away or on new right away, so it will have certain impacts. Uh, but again, I ask for the community to be patient with that. Um, any questions on all that? And then I'll go to River Road. Yes, ma'am. Yes. What was the number? The 14th project you discussed, the West Run Road, what was the project number on that? Uh, 45. It, I don't think it actually is 45. There's something messed up with that number. It's 107. It's, uh, it's a deck, replace deck project. We'll look and get it to you. But that project is again on the ends and then hopefully we'll tie that whole west run together and get it all wide because it's amazing. Um, let me take just a minute to talk about River Road. A lot of people we talked to the county commission yesterday. Um, we brought our geotechnical engineers in. Um, we met with the um, county commissioners and some others yesterday, but this is a map we put together. This is the Westover Bridge, if you're familiar with that. You make a left, that's the way you used to go up. Uh, here at the entrance, it's called Walkside Road. It goes up into the NBC Woodworking uh, residence. There was a residence over here. There's also the Mon County Dog Pound. And of course, if you go around, right here on this road, onto the Pont Road, this is the Pont. We're up in here. If you come to the Pont, it comes to the intersection with River Road. And of course, this is River Road. Believe it or not, River Road is a federal route. Kind of caught me off guard as we were looking into this. 
Um, we went through, our engineers walked the whole section from beginning to end, has came up with, <laughs> essentially there are 20 slides on this section of the road. My budget to replace slides for District 4, the six counties in a year of 1.4 million a year to replace all slides in the whole area. River Road has approximately six million dollars in slides alone. Okay, we broken it into two sections from the West Over Bridge to Lockside Drive. I think that section was. Let me get my glasses back. I think it's three and a half million. Yeah, three point four. Three point four million. The section from here to the top of the hill is uh, two point four million. Yeah. Okay. Those are estimates. Those numbers could be way off once we get into more advanced geotech work. We met with the county commission. We're going to try to work with our management. But right now, the intent's going to be that we try to maintain the upper section, put some money into that upper section, at least keep it open. That does provide access to not only the locks, which is something very important. Uh, the access to the lock and dam comes through that section of River Road. <laughs> Um, it provides access to the residents, um, and it also provides access to all the businesses. Um, at this point, we're going to try to look for a few million dollars to at least get those projects started on the upper end, and we will maintain that the best we can to make sure the businesses and the local residents can get to their home. As far as the lower section at this time, I believe we're going to leave it closed until um, there's adequate funding that comes along if that ever comes. We're also looking at, and this is what's tough, we're looking at Mon Boulevard, the big slide that's always happening on Mon Boulevard. We also have our geotech people looking at that. We haven't got the report on that, but again, we have to balance, do we spend three million on the lower part of River Road to open it, or would you rather spend three million dollars if we could get the money on Mon Boulevard? Mon Boulevard affects over 35,000 or 30 some thousand cars a day and it is constantly shutting one lane down. River Road, God bless the people, but it's eight to 10 residents and two small businesses. So we have to be smart. We've tried to get input from the county commission along these lines. We've also looked at the detours. There's a, a thing on the detour, and I think the worst case scenario was somebody would have to drive about two miles, 2.1 miles, something like that, um, versus what you could have if you'd gone downtown. Hey, Donnie. Yes. Could you also explain what the commission also recommended that you agreed to about the intersection and strengthening DuPont Road? Yeah. Because that was key to yeah. this decision. Well, we in our meeting, we had Glenn Adrian and some other people from the, um, the uh, industrial park. Well, the industrial park has been booming, growing, things like that. Well, we worked with the county commissioners, with the county commissioners, and they actually helped give us some money. We were going to have a paving project that essentially started here at Pont Road, went to the intersection at the River Road, made the right toward Marion County, and we were going to do a major, uh, a major resurfacing jobs and ditching, pipe replacement, things like that. It was around, what, 1.1 million, something yes. like that, of which the county commission had um, graciously given us 150,000 to help with that project. Then it came to our knowledge here about know, a month ago, something like that, in the industrial park they have four or five hundred miles of pipe being stored. Have you ever seen those massive piles of four pipe? And if you look out this window, you'll see them going out, 42 inch pipe. They're going to haul all of that out of there over the next 12 months. So we didn't think it would be very smart to work on this section of the road until they get that pipe out of there. So we're going to maintain it. We're still going to do the paving project from the River Road to Pont Road intersection on River Road. And the county commission, we I think we're all in agreement. We'll keep the 150,000. It's about what a 650,000 dollar project, something like that. 600, 700,000 dollar project. But then we're going to have a bigger meeting with the industrial park and some of these other people about upgrading the Pont Road. That's this road out here, so it can handle all the additional traffic in the future for the industrial park. And that might mean looking at the intersection, making sure we got good turning radii, turning lanes. And let's have a great discussion because this is going to be the primary entrance to the industrial park. Now, I know they've been having discussions about an interchange on I-79. 
let's just be honest, even if it went today, you're talking probably five, six years down the road, it's that big a process to go through all the hoops that you have to to design right away acquisition, even if it's approved the money. Would, would I be off on that bill four to five years? Uh, easily. So, easily. It could easily be seven to ten years. Yeah. yeah. So my perspective is I can't worry about the interchange if it's coming or not. What I can say is let's work together on the um, on the DuPont Road to make it a nice gateway and also being very considerate to the people in Morgantown and Westover right. as you look at this. Is that fair? Yes. Uh, just a couple of questions. Uh, for what I live in DuPont Heights on, on DuPont Road, but I'm here representing DOE um, for the Collins Ferry Access uh, Project. And uh, I'm not sure what status of that is, but with all the traffic coming through Westover, there's a section going up the hill from the, uh, from the from the Greek Church up to across the Circle K. That's really bad today. Mm -hmm. It's been torn up pretty bad. I'm not sure. I didn't see the name of it. Are we repaving or it's not there? It's in really bad shape for the amount of traffic that goes through there. But we're very aware of that. The problem about us. It's the sewer lines that failed under. Yeah, I saw love working there this past week. Yeah, so you know, dry pavement water bubbling up is a unique smell to it. <laughs> <laughs> That's not pavement juice. <laughs> yeah. So is is love going to be resurfaced in that because of that, or is that something we're we'll look at with? it. We'll probably end up doing it, but what we need to do in there, and I've talked to Mayor Johnson, Lee. Yeah, he just left. Yeah, we need to have more discussion about mud replacing those lines. Because there's actually brick under there. If you've ever noticed, there's an old brick street yeah. under there. Well, but we're getting as long as that brick. Yeah. <laughs> well, models. I don't know if it's appropriate. I'll tell you a real funny story. I have a daughter that's 20 now at WVU, but I go to church right there behind the Dairy Queen. And we were going up that hill one day, and Abigail's my daughter, and she was about 13, and the road was really bad. You could see those yellow brick. And she turned to me with all the wisdom of a music major, which she is, and she said, Daddy, when they start throwing bricks in the potholes to fix it. <laughs> well, thanks, Abigail. You're really supportive. But anyways, we need to have that discussion. We need to fix what's making that fail all the time. That's right. a constant battle. Because there's still some severe potholes in that. Yeah, area. they are in there. Yeah. They're on them. It just works. Well, they, I mean, they don't last. When you patch them, they don't last. Yeah, when, when that stuff them. fails underneath, there's nothing that's substantial. Right. Uh, one more question. Yes, on please. DuPont Road. Um, is there any... Um, with the amount of residents that live on there now, the amount of increased traffic, and I know DuPont Heights is like a blind curve right there coming around the corner. If you're stopping to turn into DuPont Heights, people fly around that corner at 45 miles an hour. There's so been DuPont Heights is just out the road here on the left. Yeah, big, up on the wrong <laughs> side. There's a, been some accidents that happen there because people are exceeding the speed limit for one, but it's a blind curve for another. And the amount of traffic coming from the schools up on the hill now, so going down the hill on River Road, it takes a while to turn left there sometimes. So like and a turning lane would help? A turning lane there would help for the people going up the hill there because of the amount of traffic coming the other way. So just keep that in consideration. Well, that's a great point. Uh, Mr. Pumphrey here has been working up on the line. The line of sight is not very good there. Yeah. And I don't know if there's any talk about reducing the speed limit on that road, too, because mm -hmm. of the amount of traffic. It's 45 now, and I think 35 might be better for some it's some of the amount of traffic that's on there. Well, speed limits are a tough issue to yeah, lower I know. <laughs> because you can lower it to 35, but if they're going 50, you're going to kill people. Yeah, you know because of that. But anyways, those are points well taken, and Mr. Pumphrey's written them down okay. because we're going to have that discussion on the whole. And I, that's a great point. You know, I, I know I'm not working on the design, but that with the industrial park and the whole thing. We want to do this right. Yeah. One of the yeah. problems we have on the Pond Road, and you're aware of this, and one of the problems of Morgantown on our roads, like uh, Barbara mentioned, 73, that the old concrete pavement underneath, probably built in the 50s on these old federal routes, it's failed. And what did they do some years ago? They paved over. And then they tried to widen. And every place it widens, you can see what happens, it breaks off that section. They weren't built correctly. So we're looking like on this, if we're going to widen this road, we want to do it correctly. Bill? Yeah, I just, one clarification. I'm on the Morgantown Utility Board, and, and there is defined areas about what MUB is responsible for water and sewer. Okay, so I don't want people in this room to, to suggest that MUB is going to fix every sewer pipe in the greater area, because that's not, that's not how, 
how it works and not, not who owns it. So if you do have an issue and Mayor Johnson and Moab can get together and work with you to fi figure out where it is, then that's the solution to the problem. It's yeah, that's what we've said. That right. We've talked to Mayor Johnson. It's a Moab issue in the sense the sewer line we've been told has collapsed through there. It's probably an old terracotta, an old type of system. It may have been there who knows how long, 50, 70 years. And until we get that fixed, we just throw money after money, you know, into the hole. So we need to get that fixed, or, or we can even partner together like a project where maybe Mud would pay for all these sewer work, while we're, and we'd come back and do them. But again, it's always about one thing, money. You know, if we had unlimited money, we could fix it all for it, but we are aware of and looking at it. Well, the, it looks like West Room of Riddle is 107. Oh, okay, 107. Thank you, sir. Looks like 107. Okay, two other real quick things, and then I'm going to quit. Any other questions on River Road? <clears throat> Mr. Kelly? Just a comment. If, uh, say, for example, if for whatever reason, DuPont Road would have to be closed, then you're looking at an emergency route to get to people from mm -hmm. Harmony Grove and on up Booth and that area. There's several smaller roads that cut across from there over 219. Is that something maybe take a look at as to... We could always look at it. Um, no, I'm not saying build a yeah. road, but I'm saying maybe upgrade some of those roads so if there was an emergency, yeah. the, the fire truck or whatever. Yeah. You no, know, I've had people say, well, yeah. we need River Road, go to schools out there. But once you get past River Road, a tractor trailer could wreck and have the same effect from River Road on because it's a one lane road or it's two lanes. You know, um, it's been something nice, but it's realistic. But I think, Mr. Kelly, Points well taken. We can at least look at that. Well, there's several, like Glory Barn Road, and there's several that cut across. Yeah. You know, like I said, I'm just saying maybe to upgrade those so that we did need to yeah. use them, they'd be available. We could look at those. Again, it's all about it's money. where do we put it at. Uh, um, lastly, I'll say two things. We have been working on the pedestrian issues, and I'm pretty excited how we're going with that. We've been very proactive on that, and um, it's a great interaction with the community. We have representatives from a lot of local sources. And like I said, we have a subject matter expert that's so looking. We got what we call bucket one done. Uh, we're moving on to buckets two and three, which is more long term. And then last thing is we are working on what's called a stakeholders committee. One of the things that I'm working on really hard is how to get this information out on a regular basis. We've struggled with that. A lot of things <coughs> happening. So we're having some um, preliminary discussions with different avenues of how to get information out. So it's, River Road disinformation, we get it out, or we decide to start work, or 705, we've got it open to four lanes, but for the next two weeks we have to shut down portions. Some way to let the folks that live in Montegale County understand what's about to happen. But it's a big subject, we're looking on it, we're in the very preliminary stages. So. On Kingwood Pike. Pardon? Kingwood Pike. The slide on Kingwood Pike. Yes. It's my understanding it's a purchase order project. Josh, do you know? The nails, yeah. Yeah, the soil nail project, um, and July 1st. That's when the money's allocated, July 1st. We've, I think we've contacted the central office to see if they can move ahead a little bit because of the emergency, but we're very aware of that. Um, we have other slides that we're dealing with that is in the FEMA process. So we've got 18 months to get that work done. So. This is your last chance, and any other questions for me? Yes, ma'am. Um, it looks to me like number 72, um, I think that's coming up in the hall of the church, and it's Jace Run and Statler Run. Am I right about that? Um, yes. Talk, you know? and, and that went out to bid. It came in over bid. We're going to reject it. We did it. Okay. Do we have any idea? I mean, it's really, really bad. Do we have any idea when that might happen? Um, or like the, it's, it's listed as a 2018. It was, it came in, the estimate was 325000 It came in a half million. So we're going to look at it, rebid it. You're, we're pro hopefully we'll have it bit out to bid in August and hopefully it's pushed dated this year. Hopefully this year? Hopefully this year. Still, okay, and then my second question, I'd like to go back for a little. Um, if you look at Riddle, it looks like it's, um, it has, uh, a highway designation um, as a county road. Are, are you sure, Ron, that that's, that's a private road? Are you sure if you drive in Riddle, that's, uh, it does a county road designation. Does that mean it? 
a it party. It has a county route designation of 61 over 4. Um, we will look at it for 2019 paving, but we have to look into the agreement of the maintenance that with TAC is and see whose responsibility is it. You're saying, are you trying to say Riddle Road is, is state road? I have to look into it with Mr. Tackett. I think it is. It's, it's classified on the map as 61 over 4. I mean, that could be Pineview Drive, 61 over 4. Pineview stops down around J.D. Anderson. From there on up, it is a... We uh, have to look at the maps with yeah. Mr. Tackett and actually figure out where that stops. Illegally, who owns it? At the yeah. turn is yeah. where it stops. When, 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 you, when you look at that, find out when the bridge was put in across West Run Creek because it was a dead end road. Yeah. And, so, and that will be the time frame we're looking for. Uh, I believe it's from Pineview <coughs> up, it's 0 0.91 right. miles from the right of way back. So, me and Tackett will review here soon. Well, that said, um, yeah. I, um, yeah. 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 go ahead, sir. Let's go here from you. Okay, just one more question. Uh, number 66 says PIE. So the one, PIE, what does that mean? Preliminary investigation. That's a geo bond project. Okay. PIE stands for preliminary investigation and engineering. Okay. So all the geo bond projects, except the one on the mile ground, you know, the way the geo bonds were set up, none of those projects were designed. So we've hired consultants, and some of them are under contract, some aren't. But they are doing an engineering study that hopefully will take a set of plans to 30%. So that stands for preliminary investigation and in engineering. Okay. So all the geo bonds, the West Run, the Green Bank Road, um, you know, all these projects, um, Beechers, they all have consultants select. I don't know if they're all in the contract. The Northern Connector, <coughs> you know, that big project, um, that's under consultant. Um, all these are starting. Bill? Okay. Manpower costs money, okay, and, and you've made it very clear that you have limited manpower and, and because, because of salaries. Okay, so a couple of years ago, the state legislature went through the prevailing wage process, and I don't know if it's under a legal challenge or not. So when these projects are out there, whether it's cleaning a ditch or filling potholes or putting down blacktop, can, can, can you get away with less than prevailing wage for the cost of the project on some projects, but by federal law, if you're working on U.S. routes or interstates, you, are, you have to follow federal guidelines. So can you enlighten us a little bit about prevailing wage, $25 an hour, or your people at $12 an hour, or the city of Morgantown at $15 an hour, what, pick a number, whatever they are, but why, what cost does it take to fix a bottle and it, as opposed to a cost of running a paving machine? Um, that wasn't on my slide. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but that's really right, let me money. try to answer the best I can. On federal projects, any route that's designated as a federal, like a Route 7, we have to pay for value. It, 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 we have yeah. to pay data spaking. If in the guidelines of the state project goes out to bid, there's some projects we actually do that are on Fed aid routes that are 100% state. If they go out 100% state, we do not have to pay prevailing wage. If they go out as a 80-20 project, we have to pay prevailing wage. What I'm finding is right now, with the limited number of crews out there, there's no difference. They're people, bidding at the prevailing They're bidding at the prevailing wage because they can't get people to come out unless you're paying to pay prevailing wage. We just received bids May 15th. We sent it out. If you go to the West Virginia DOT letting site, all the packages for the PSEs go out to bid through the site. We had like 15 to 20 projects that went out. Each one has a bid package, each one has pricing. We are getting charged just for a flagger per hour on the federal jobs and on the state jobs at $60 an hour. They're not bidding non-federal and non-state. They're bidding whatever they can get guys out here to do. And what they're finding out is if you're not paying for a wage, they're not going to come work for you because they know there's enough work here now to not have to do it. Okay, because he has very few people to work with and he can't do it in-house, the cost goes per labor hour of $15 an hour automatically to 60 or 50 Pick a number. Well, that's a bid number. They're not paying 60 They're being paid 60 But let me try and Josh is correct. Right. Federal routes, for the most part, had to pay prevailing wage and is under David Bacon or David Bacon. There was legislation, and a lot of the legislature, there was legislation passed a few years ago 
have said on state routes, you don't have to pay prevailing wage, right, along those lines. But what's happening, the contractor that's doing the paving on a federal route is also doing the paving on the state route using the same crews. So they're not going to go in there and say, for the most part, they're not saying, well, we're going to pay you $29 an hour to be a flagman on this project, but you go to the state project, we're going to pay you 14 Those people won't work for that. So what's happening is, I honestly don't know the actual number, but what I've seen too, and what Josh has articulated so well, it's make very little difference on the bottom line of the cost per project, okay? We do not pay per milling wage, all right? So the question's been coming up, and you've seen all this stuff about what can we do? Well, we're looking at the options, okay? But with limited resources in terms of funding, to do supplemental work, so if we did pothole patching, if we did um, brush cutting, right? If we did ditching, we're doing estimates of prevailing wage of what it would cost. So if my crews, or our maintenance crews, for example, does a ditching project, people just don't seem to understand it. It's just not one guy on a backup. It's like a nine-man crew. You have to have pilots, you, trucks. You've got to have traffic control, right? You've got to have flight. Okay, you got to do it safely. You got two people driving the truck, <coughs> carrying the asphalt back and forth. You got a guy on a rover, and you got two to three guys slinging the asphalt. Right? It's eight or nine person crew. So as we look at that, to get that equivalent, all right, from a contractor, whatever we do it for a mile, I'm going to guess it's going to be about three times per mile per contract. And it's because our guy throwing the asphalt is getting paid twelve to fifteen dollars an hour. The guy with the contractor slinging the same asphalt. It's going to be paid 25 or 30 an hour, okay? And labor is usually the biggest component. Like a pothole patching, I for what is 18 tons a mile. It's not very much asphalt. It's all about labor, okay? So we're working on that, and I'm sure people much smarter than me will figure out how to answer that. Again, it's a constant struggle. Bill brings it up. Right now in Mon County, I'm just being very honest and transparent. We have a quota of 48. I think I'm down to 22 now. We've lost nine more employees. You know, they come to work for us, they get their CDL, and they can double their salary anywhere. It's a constant struggle. Um, but I don't sit here and make excuses. We try to maximize those 22, 23 people. Uh, we do run a night crew on Route 7 or on 705, those places. That takes three to four people. We've got six or seven of those out in the western end of the county in Pinterest. So we got all this, all this work taking place with the slide that pulls some of our resources. It's a constant struggle. Okay, I'm not gonna lie to you, but we try to do the best we can. So we get hammered. Everybody thinks that we're some miracle workers. We're not. We try to get the most we can, and we're we working on some solutions to help with this. So just be patient. But. So of these projects you discussed today, what percentage of them will be? done by the Division of Highways Workers and what percentage is going to be contracted? Out? They're all contracted. All contracted out. So, and as you're saying, none of it will be below prevailing wage then, is what you're saying? I'm not seeing the major set cost savings. It's bid that prevailing wage isn't required, right, but, but we have no control why it's being bid. It's a competitive act. Right, it's correct. based on low bid along those lines. So, so that's just what's happening in the, in the It's market. just reality of the market. And this is going to get worse, folks. Because but this kind of work in limited contractors, you're going to see prices. We already saw one letting down in Beckley, was it? How much was that over contract? There's one bidder. It was like $46 million over contract. They rejected it. As this work comes out, and you only have so many contractors, they're going to get their bellies full, right? And then they're going to throw big numbers. Because before the legislature passed the um, the legislation to allow a vote on the bond, the Secretary of Transportation did tell um, a group of leaders of us on the Finance Committee in the House that the work that's not doesn't have commingling with federal funds would you know, not be let out at prevailing wage. And um, I, I was concerned about the amount of projects going out would increase the cost. Of the well, it's on the state route, but no, it's just and, and basic economics. And how you generalization? You're looking at it statewide also. Yeah. yeah. This is North Central Ed West Virginia region, you got to look at it more locally. Right there are some places we, that have very few federal routes. They're all state routes. It, so. it, even if we bid 100% of the 
the project is 100% state, which means it goes out non-federal. We don't have the workers up here that some of the southern part of the state see. Right. So you may not see that wage be bid federal wage down there, but you're seeing it up here just because they can't find enough people. It's the competition. And are there any in-state contractors that are winning the bids on these? In-state oh, yeah. are what we let on May 15th, pretty much 90% like in-state. Most of your paving work is in-state contractors. Yes. Now I think when you start getting to these much larger projects, they're going to see much bigger contractors come after it. But for Mountaineer contracting on Preston County here, um, Dodd Corporation, your West Jam Pavings, these are local contract, bear contracting that's out of Clarksburg. That's just getting a majority of our paving work. So the good news is they're trying to staff up too. But you know, um, without giving all my soapbox, that's the problem that kids don't want to work in these fields anymore. Mm -hmm. That's a big issue, folks. I, I have two college degrees. I'm working in this job, and the guy raking asphalt will make more this year for a contractor than I will as a licensed professional engineer. And we need to somehow, we've talked about education, CDLs, we need our young men and women to say, there's a huge market to make a really good way of life. And trust me, they don't look like me. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to get off all this. I'd like to turn this over to WVU, if that's okay. And then um, Damien, and then Bill, is that okay? Well, I sure appreciate you all taking time today. I know it's been long, but I think this is a great effort. And we invited these other ones because I thought it'd be good while we had us to talk about these other projects. Thank you, Donnie, for uh, inviting us to come and showcase some of the projects you're working on. Uh, my name is Matt Latimer. I manage the facilities planning department. Uh, I'm John Thompson. I'm with uh, Design and Construction and Facilities at WVU. So we're just going to highlight a few projects that we're working on um, really briefly, in about 15 minutes or so, and then we'll turn it back over to the city. As I mentioned, um, we have about uh, three or four kind of primary active projects we're working on right now. Um, uh, Donnie mentioned the new b and &E mixed use complex, which will include a new college for the business and economics, it also includes a recreation space, housing and food. Uh, we're also currently um, working on some space improvements to Arnold Hall to act as some temporary space to move some folks out of Stansbury. And uh, John will touch on the Hodges Hall interior renovation project and we do a complete gut of the interior of Hodges and turning that over to the College of um, Everly College of uh, Arts and Sciences. And of course every every summer we have a variety of deferred maintenance projects that keep us keep us busy. So as we mentioned, at the top left is where the current College of Business and Economics building is. Um, we're planning to demo Stansbury, where the bottom circle is located, and replace that with a new building, which is kind of wedged right in between the PRT tracks. The sites to the left and the right, which are currently parking, will remain as parking. And the building is going to be made up majority of uh, our business in College of Business and Economics, 56% uh, of that. Um, it's also going to be made up about 15% of recreation. We figured it's logical to take advantage of the adjacent rail trail and the adjacent river, maybe bring some of our bike services down, down to this location. Um, and right now, 24% of that space is potentially residential to act as like a live-learn community with the Business and Economics College. And then 5% would be food and, food and service. So right now, we're really early in the process of conceptual design. Um, playing with shapes and how this how this thing is going to fit into the site. Um, this is just one example of many that we're, we're considering. Um, to the left could potentially be the, the housing component. To the right could potentially be the business and economics building. Um, <coughs> we're really wanting to kind of keep that uh, access to the river from the campus open, so keeping some views open to the river. And um, the demo stands for is planned for late winter of 2018, uh, spring 2019. We're hoping to complete the project uh, late 2021. We're not planning to add any parking as part of the project, and an important uh, component of this will be replacing that uh, uh, bridge that connects the PRT tracks to Stansbury currently, um, encouraging pedestrians and our students to cross over the bridge to avoid the river. 
Um, you might be familiar with this Arnold Hall Swing Space project. Again, this was a former uh, dormitory that was vacated. Uh, we needed a space to put everybody who's currently in Stansbury. So we're doing some minor cosmetic upgrades to the dormitories, uh, some carpeting and paint. And uh, today, actually, this week, we've been moving a lot of the faculty over from Stansbury to vacate the building to prepare it to be demoed. Um, so again, that's occurring currently. Uh, the Z building is uh, Arnold Hall, which will be occupied. The, the tower there is Arnold Apartments, and for the most part, that will remain vacant for security reasons. And again, the, the spaces will be used as temporary office spaces until the Beanie and Hodges projects are completed. So we'll talk a little bit about Hodges Hall. Um, as Matt mentioned, we're just in the early stages of it. We're just now hiring the architects. So these are the b and &E and, and Hodges Hall, which are pretty much um, right across the street from one another. Um, we're starting to work on. So that'll be, um, it's a major classroom building for the university. But um, I attended class there about 20 years ago. And if you sit in the classroom there today, it's not much different. So we're going to completely gut the building um, and renovate it to modern standards. Um, you see the window air conditioning units in the building. It'll be all um, central air condition um, for the Everly Office of Undergraduate, um, Women and Gender Studies, um, a couple other programs there, but basically it, it's, a, it's a huge classroom building for the downtown campus. So, um, and both of these projects, so, so we're, we're going to do some internal demo on this project this fall and start construction probably about this time next year, and that'll be a one year project to be open uh, towards the fall of 2020. So. This project will be going on for a year, probably construction across the street. The B&E building will be going on for about two years. And potentially we're coordinating with the Department of Highways with what's going on with Beechhurst in between, making sure that we're you know, set back appropriately for whatever they might be doing in between there. So uh, these are two of the major projects that we have going on. This slide is just summer uh, 2018 projects. We have 71 small deferred maintenance projects that we have. It's just throughout campus, roofs, air handling equipment, um, you know, mostly internal to the campus, much less, you know, we have had projects in the past where we like to share with the community because it disrupts traffic. Most of our projects this summer are within the campus and really will not have, you, you probably won't even know that they're going on. But every year we do, when the students leave, we take that opportunity to freshen up our classrooms, freshen up our laboratories. So. Um, that's pretty much it, what we're going to share. I mean, our volume of construction right now is you know, much less than we've had over the past five years, and we're planning for these, uh, the two big projects coming up. And there's always other projects that pop up here and there, but Hodges Hall and the new b and &E building are going to be our you know, biggest, most visu visu visible projects as you, uh, you know, drive through uh, Morgantown. So with that, we can... What's the current b and &E? Once you have it open a new one, what's the current, what's going to be there? Well, in the future, yeah, so once the college moves into the new facility, that building will be turned over to the Everly College, who also is, is asking for space for, for growth. So we apply for the offices and classrooms. The reason why I asked Donnie, I, I mentioned the pedestrian museum, and I thought it was, it was, given my age, I thought it was curious. Some of the young people on that committee suggested that we do away with the loop for University Avenue and put a bridge across. Like we used to have the stadium bridge, used to go across. But is that ever in the, the campus plan as a possibility? I think the well, there's more pedestrian safety because that loop yeah. is terribly yeah. dangerous pedestrian. Yeah, I mean that whole area where the parking is at, um, there's, there's been several ideas thrown around. We haven't really pursued anything too closely. Um, but that, that one option you mentioned has been, you know, considered and reviewed. Our focus right now has kind of been on these two projects, but that's always been something that's on in, in the background. Yeah, I mean, in the, in, we have looked at building sites in there with the old falling around area, and I think talking to the city, I mean, that's going to take everybody working together to plan in that area if we ever want to, you know, <clears throat> it is property that we own in there, but, you know, it'll take a, yeah, well, some realignment of the road. Project. I'm yeah. not the it's much more convenient. And the loop was almost reserved for students. 
is the one project uh, we discussed earlier, uh, Foundry Street, not Foundry Street, uh, Huff Street. Uh, are you still looking at closing, uh, doing work on the old emissions record building there that potentially impact uh, Huff Street this summer? Um, probably between Hodges and um, admissions and records there. I don't, I don't believe we have anything scheduled right now, but as we do, um, you know, Huff Street and, and um, our bus pull off there, there will be probably areas where you'll have temporary uh, deliveries and, and loading out equipment and stuff like that, so that it could potentially be impacted. But I don't, I'm not sure of anything this summer for, for not, the yeah, not immediate future. Questions? Okay, thank you. I appreciate it. So, uh, going along with uh, DOH's north side of town, uh, the cut through streets that people would normally take, uh, Killarney and Laurel Street, to get around uh, 7 to 5, we'll be paving those uh, this summer. Uh, those two streets actually do have. Uh, they are big cut throughs, and in the past we've recognized that, so they do have uh, a series of speed humps on them to try to calm traffic on those streets. We'll be putting those back. Uh, our biggest street that's going to have the most impact is going to be University Avenue. We're going from Patterson Drive to uh, where we uh, left off with our Beverly Avenue, 3rd Street, uh, University Avenue project. Uh, they're around the U Club place. Uh, we're going to be going through there, doing repaving that, and then uh, doing some of the curb asphalt curving along there. Uh, and we're also going to be below, below that third street project where we left off, uh, pick up the, down there uh, on University from Campus Drive up and then doing Campus Drive itself. So that whole corridor is going to be affected. Uh, the other area, Willowdale Drive, is a major route. Uh, the only, that's the only cut through we're not doing right now is North Street. Uh, it's North Street that you've cut through from University to Willowdale. Uh, but we're looking at that potentially next year, North Street. Uh, uh, Richwood Avenue is a big, big, big uh, main route for the city. Uh, and then the sections of Grand Street, that's a, a huge cut through for us as well. Uh, so those are all going to have pretty big impacts to traffic. Uh, our paving project, uh, the bids are due Friday. Uh, so we'll know more uh, Friday if uh, uh, we'll, we'll select a contractor uh, and then we'll sit down with them in the next couple weeks to kind of go over a schedule. Uh, once we do go over them with a schedule, we'll put that out on our website. Uh, Andrew Stacy, our communications director, has been doing a pretty good job. Uh, and so we'll get with him. Uh, we'll probably be sending it out to, to Ben as well to get that information out uh, to make sure that uh, uh, people know when traffic's going to be affected. Most of these roadways, uh, normally when we do some of the smaller streets, we'll allow the contractor to close the whole section of the roadway so we can get in there and out. Uh, but with these uh, major routes and the volume of traffic on these routes, we'll uh, be, uh, they'll have to have flaggers or uh, leave one lane of traffic open. So uh, most of these roads are two lane routes. Uh, so there isn't, you know, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll be uh, flaggers with traffic control and um, uh, the ability just to have one lane. So there will be lots of delays uh, when we're doing some of these major routes. Uh, that's our biggest project. We do have a, a city uh, hall project we're doing. We're doing the facade on City Hall. Uh, we're going to be asking the UH for some lane closure, for a single lane closure there on uh, Spruce Street, uh, which shouldn't impact traffic too bad. Uh, uh, there's still two full lanes there. Uh, that's about it for us. Uh, any questions? Yeah. Here's your contract. Uh, Friday, we'll know. Uh, the bids are due Friday. Right now, uh, Anderson Excavating and Product Paving are the uh, only two contractors that I came to the pre-bid meeting, uh, so it'll probably be one of those two. Uh, they both, we did a paving project last year, we, we did 12 miles of roadway, 12, 13 miles of roadway, and we split it in half and actually both of those, uh, Anderson did the north side of the town, Product did the south side of town. Uh, this year we're doing about six miles of roadway, so we just did one contract. What's your anticipated time cost? Uh, we're looking at around 1.8 million. Oh, per ton. We're looking around a, a hundred and some dollars per ton uh, was what we had last year. Uh, we're hoping to be around that again this year. Uh, total project budget, we're looking around 1.8 million. Uh, with that project, we've got, uh, I believe, around 188 ramps we'll be doing as well. 
there is some concrete curbing we're going to be doing down on the lower portion of University Avenue by uh, Evansdale Drive uh, and University Avenue. There's that gravel section between the sidewalk and the roadway. Um, we did the intersection of Oakland and University. We brought a concrete curb around there to kind of define that and try to get rid of that. It's always in the gravelly, muddy area, and so we're going to continue that curb down to Evansdale Drive to try to uh, fix that area as well. With this, what are you seeing for your ADA ramp cost? Uh, last year, we're, last couple of years, we're between uh, two to three thousand dollars per ramp uh, is is the, the price we've been seeing, and so I anticipate around that again this year. Uh, and we're looking at we we base that on a, a two yards of concrete per ramp. Uh, plus the, the press and ADA uh, pad. We do, uh, if, if we, when we do our ADA ramps, we, we try to fix areas outside of those. You know, if, if we're, our ramps here uh, in the concrete slab next to it's in bad shape, we'll take that concrete slab next to it. And so we, we adjust that, con that price at the end of the contract. If we go over two, average over two yards, we end up paying the contract a little more. Uh, for those ramps, but it's been around two to three thousand dollars per ramp uh, for a project. Any, any chance that you're going to do something at work at night? Uh, for paving, we the contractors asked if they could. Uh, so areas that we might do uh, would be like the Campus Drive, University Avenue section, maybe done at night. Uh, we 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 talked to contractors at our previous meeting saying that uh, if, if we can entertain that, we we have no issues with with doing it at night. Uh, uh, so we, we may do. I remember we did pave a portion of University Avenue back in 2009, I believe it was. Uh, and it was done during the day, and it wasn't that, you know, for me, I was out there, so it wasn't that bad of an impact for me. I was already there. I wasn't going anywhere. But I, I don't remember it being that bad. Uh, I'm trying to think of the contractor it was on that, I think Mountaineer uh, was the contractor back then in 2009, and they did a fairly good job of traffic control. And, they had a pilot car uh, <coughs> driving back and forth, kind of leading the traffic. Uh, and so we're gonna, if, if we go on routes like that, that's kind of, we're going to be requesting that contractors do stuff like that. Well, I think that it would be great for the community if they can do this, a lot of this work at night. But have you got any, I know you haven't received a bid yet, but do you have any sense that the bids might be, the cost might be driven up because of the uh, work we, going on? We did sit down with Greer. Well, not, not the cost driven up, but the, Time frame may be dragged out. Uh, we we met with Greer. Uh, they had some concerns with uh, you know they're they're bidding on a lot of state projects, and so they've got they've got a lot of state uh, tonnage to, to provide the state. And so they said they may they may end up having issues with uh, providing our contracts with uh, asphalt when they need it, uh, depending on how the state's working. Yeah. Plus, well, your contractors like Prada, yeah. Anderson, they don't do much state. No, actually, yeah. Actually, your city and Anderson do a lot more state work yeah. as purchase as orders. As purchase orders. Or yeah. Greer yeah. plus as subcontracting through larger contracts. Yeah. But they yeah. don't get the PS&E back. Not no. at this point. Yeah. And, and, and so that's that's our biggest concern is that if the state's putting out, you know, 10,000 tons, Greer's going to, we're going to have a hard time getting uh, asphalt. Uh, and so it may end up uh, delaying our project, uh, which we're hoping to, our time frame right now, we have uh, certain streets we can label as student sensitive areas. That has to be done by uh, August 1st. Uh, so University Avenue would be one of those. Campus Drive would be one of those. Uh, those have to be done by August 1st. We want to try to get those done before the students move back in. Uh, and then the, us, the, the rest of them, I believe it is by uh, September uh, 1st is the, the deadline for the other streets. But if we're having, if the contractors have an issue getting asphalt, they're, they're uh, uh, they may request additional time to, and they may push those students into the ones farther out, those students being back. Thank you very much for sharing this map with us. I was wondering about College Avenue. Have, have you been up and down College? It, it's kind of a... That's their road. It's on my state route, yeah. It, College Avenue is a state route. College, route, college yeah. Avenue is a state. It's a county route. Uh, the county route is also something. something. We just fixed the sign of the roads in back. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. talk to Donnie about that one. Okay. That's All it. Right. We have, in this district, we are sending out three design build ADA ramp contracts. Harrison County, Marion County, and Maughan and Preston. What we're doing in, as a DOH, we're 
Damien's fixing the ramps. The last few years, we've been putting ramps into our PSV package because anywhere you get those ramps, they have to meet FHWA guidelines. What this division decided to do, they decided, decided to bid them as a design build. So we have multiple locations throughout this county that we're going to fix some ramps. College Avenue has two or three ramps that we need to fix. After we fix them for FHWA, then we can look at it being on a future paving project where we could either do a purchase order or a ps &E, but we do not have to design, we do not have to build. So at that point, it's just mill and fill or pavement. Because he's actually doing it in as part of his projects. Um, we've been doing it a lot, especially down in Harrison County, and it's part of our projects. But by having us do a design build, it takes out a lot of engineering and a lot of oversight. And that's a good point. He makes that uh, with, we're doing with our project, and that, and that uh, you'll see our project start, but they'll go out there and do the ADA ramps first. And so paving <coughs> won't start immediately. Uh, they got to get in there and do the ADA ramps first before they can actually pave those streets. So if I could follow up, do you have any idea how long that might be? That ADA project is coming out of Design Build in Charleston. I think it should be let in the next month or two. Those ADA ramps will be completed by April 19th, as I believe they're 18. It, next April completion dates. What about the, the we, we will look at the paving in a future paving package. So it would be like 1920? De depending on our funding levels. I'm not going to know our funding levels till a later date, but I would assume that's an area that we planned in the future by fixing these ramps. We could look at paving in the next few years, yes. Okay. Yeah, that's too hard to see in there. Um, you recently, uh, the first question has to do with drainage. And yeah. that they, you recently did Raleigh Lane. Um, yes. Or Raleigh Avenue. Excuse yeah. me. Lane's out. Yeah. Uh, and you did a total rebuild yes. on the drainage and, and, and everything there. Also, you reduced the size of the street a little bit. And I'm not sure why that was done. It was probably only, you know, four to six inches. It was about six inches. Yeah. yeah. I, was, I walked my dog there. So. Yeah. So, uh, it was that because, because of the drainage or why? That was one, that's one question. I don't want to throw bubble under the bus, but they set, we, they set the inlets and then we built to those inlets. Uh, and it could also be that the curbs on there before were the uh, roll, roll curves. curves. Yeah. Uh, and we put the straight up, uh, straight up monolithic curb uh, through there, so we may have uh, bumped in a little bit. But uh, yeah, it was a, it was an effort between the city and MUB. Um, they had uh, some collapse pipes. So, so it wasn't a plan. It wasn't a plan. It was just a construction it. issue, probably. Okay. Uh, that you know, MUB needs to look at your map closer to what you really want to say. You yeah, want yeah. to say, but I'll say. But no, uh, yeah, it, it's just a construction issue that you know we, we were. Six inches off, or four to six inches off. Put it back. The second question it, it has been a, a long time question that I have asked a lot of times, uh, having grown up and having been uh, in a lot of buildings in the city. Uh, when you don't grind, you just keep putting asphalt on. I got a couple of buildings on, on uh, University Avenue where actually. There's no curb left. A, there's no curb left, number one. Number two, the building, just as uh, 15, 20 years ago, was only about a third below the road surface. And now, practically the whole building is below the road surface. And there's no drainage there. So all the water off that new pavement just slams into my building. Now, that's not just me. There's a whole bunch of yeah. buildings along yeah. that. What can be done about that? Is there any plan to put any sort of drainage to try to prevent that or drying the road down or do something? Yeah, every street we're doing this year, unless it's a concrete street that we're overlaying, we are milling off two inches of asphalt, um, putting back two inches of asphalt. That's great. Or if it's, if it's like that, uh, like uh, Waitman Street, uh, there's barely any curb left there, we're going to build about four inches off and put two inches back to get at least a little bit of curb reveal so that you do have that drainage. So every street we are doing, in the last two, three years, we've just we've, uh, we're milling the entire width of them. Uh, since milling mm -hmm. was, is fairly cheap uh, in the grand scheme of things, uh, where we've been... It's cheaper than building. Uh, yeah. The drain system, yeah. Like so the, to do it the last two years, we've uh, just milled the full width of the street, you know, uh, two inches at least, 
uh, and then put it back inch and a half, two inches, or you know, try to take it a little deeper on places where it wasn't any dirt. Yeah, that's great news. Yeah. A lot of people will be happy here. Right? Yeah, Waitman's one of those perfect. Like we we went out and made that, and if there's barely any curb left. There's you know half an inch, and so we're going to take that down a lot deeper. Okay, thank you. So I was just wondering on the campus drive repaving. Yes. That's just a, a repaving yes. project. Yes. So this so the DOH activity, which is fifty four, that's the Beechers have campus drive and then it's a realignment. That's a completely separate yes. later project. And that's still under design right now. So we're going forward with our project and then in the future when they get their project then uh, we'll look at that. But uh, there, there are really a lot of projects going from I think McLean down. Uh, so that, that section would be affected uh, that we've already paid, but uh, their up would be affected in their realignment project. Yeah. Anything else? All right. well, thanks. I'm going to turn it over to Bill, Bill Austin from the MTO. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Damien. I'm Bill Austin, the executive director of Morgantown Line at the MTO, and I'm between you and lunch, so I find it to be very, very short and brief. Um, first, I'd like to thank Mountain Line for hosting this event. I think they, these are wonderful facilities, and uh, they, they partner with the city and DOH and operating their vehicles on um, their roadways, and it's a very productive partnership, and I did want to make that comment and thank DOH um, and Mountain Line for having this event. I certainly want to thank both uh, DOH, uh, the city, and WBU for uh, being at this event. I'll do just a very short plug for what the NPO does. And our job is twofold. First, uh, our NPO policy board has to approve the use of any federal funds within our urban area. Um, and so our policy board members have been aware of a lot of these projects that DOH has been discussing and working on. And secondly, our job is to develop the urban areas long range transportation plans where we identify congested areas and uh, potential improvements that can address those congestion as well as planning new roads to help alleviate congestion and, and the area uh, grow. That's our primary purpose. Uh, we solicit a lot of public input and so I certainly hope you will follow the MPO at our website plantogether.org. I hope we'll be able to have the videos from this meeting um, available on our website as I'm sure the city and the county commission and others will have available. Um, so I hope you will follow the MPO as we uh, work with uh, our various member entities um, uh, to move forward uh, transportation in our area. Uh, and I, I do want to especially commend uh, Mr. Williams and his staff for this effort. I think it's been an excellent effort. There's going to be a lot of ongoing construction and we want the public and our uh, institutions um, to be aware of this construction so they can plan uh, for their employees' uh, commutes on a daily basis. So I would just like to wrap it up and thank everybody for your attendance. Thank you, Mr. Williams, for hosting it, uh, for putting it together, and uh, we look forward to our improved transportation effort. Thank you. Don't forget if you want a map, you just make the map. Your mud bogging work in the fields or just cruising, the Tire Lady has just the right tire for you. And if you want your ride to really stand out, ask about tire and wheel combinations. Get the most out of your vehicle with the perfect set of shoes from the Tire Lady at Rainbow Tire in Masontown. The Tire Lady will take care of you. Rainbow Tire, the Tire Lady takes care of me. Rainbow Tire. 
At the Landing Dental Spa, our goal is to provide quality dental care at a relaxed spa-like atmosphere. Dental chairs with heat and massage, warm neck wraps, and personal TVs make your appointment as stress-free as possible. Located off the Pierpont exit, now accepting new patients of any age. Call 304-594-2200 today and visit our website at www.thelandingdentalspa.com to schedule an appointment. The Landing Dental Spa, a healthy smile with peace of mind.